Tonight we'll be in the 21st chapter of Genesis. We get in very much now into the development of God's purpose. Several observations we want to make from this text. We'll be reviewing the first 21 verses of Genesis 21. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Isaac bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah would have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was waned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was waned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, and because of thy bondwoman, and all that Sarah has said unto thee, Hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, took bread and a bottle of water, gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle. And she cast the child under one of the shrubs. She went and sat her down against over over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot, for she said, Let me not see the death of the child. She sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Now, as you know, as we've emphasized throughout this text, this is not just a, a history lesson. Yeah. It's not just a biography. Or In all of this, I want, I'm going to underscore this as we go through this book continually, but God is teaching humanity about himself. <laughs> He's showing himself to humanity. The nature of God's being revealed. I'm going to mention some of these things, and you probably thought about it, but I want to, this helps us to get our focus, see. He's is made known all up to this point. He makes things happen. Yeah, amen. That's right. Among human, human, in humanity. He makes things happen. And you see that in the imposition of death upon humanity, he made it happen. Mm -hmm. He didn't ask you want to die, he made it. He expelled Adam and Eve from the garden. He didn't ask them if they wanted to go. He expelled them. Make things happen. 
He made Cain a wanderer. Cain didn't have any choice in this. And he stopped the builders at Shinar. He makes things happen. And he destroyed the whole world except for eight persons in the flood. He made it happen. No, no, nobody, you may say God doesn't force people to do anything, but you've got you to gotta quit reading the Bible to say things like that. Because so far he's made a lot of people do things. Made them do it, whether they wanted to or not. And the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is another example. And Adma and Zeboam, we always people eliminate those last two cities. We've learned in this book he delivers the godly. Noah for one, Abraham for another. He'll not tolerate this with the God now, which is the real God we're being exposed to. He'll not tolerate disobedience. Adam and Eve, they, there, are, there are epitaphs to that. He will not receive something from a defiled person. Cain, example, he accepts offerings from a person that he accepts. Abel, he always gives adequate warning. Gave it to Cain, gave it to the world in Noah's day, gave it to Abimelech the king, see? He thwarts the working of those who proceed without him. He just... A lot, of, a lot of projects that went belly up because God's just stopped them. But see, the church used to be informed. People who were Christians were scripturally literate so they could interpret what happened in the world. We don't have many people that can do that. Now, there are, there are a few public figures that they're criticized for what they say, but they, they can interpret what's happening. And he chooses whoever he wants. Seth, out of all the offspring Adam had, Seth. That was, the, that was the one he chose. From Noah, Shem, one he chose. From Terah, he had three sons, Abraham's one he chose. So it's, he's demonstrating that God chooses who he wills. And he knows the hearts of people. Cain, he told him what was in his heart. Told Noah it was in the heart of all humanity, desperately wicked. And we know he doesn't hide what he's going to do from those he accepts. Told Noah what he's going to do. Told Abraham what he's going to do. See, this is being revealed. He'll not overlook the abuse of his people. It may look like people getting by with it. Abimelech and Abraham are example. Yeah. Lot and Sodom are example. Ishmael and Isaac are example. See? People can't fool with God's people and get by with it. Oh, no, it may look like they are. No, it may look like they do, but they don't. Amen. So when anybody speaks against God's people, it's logged down. It's not forgotten. Yes. Amen. That's why you, you don't have to take any vengeance. See? Yes. Ultimately, the rejected and the accepted can't dwell together. No in the world. Separate them. Abraham in Egypt, Abraham and Ur, Abraham and Haran, see, ultimately can't dwell together. Lot, taken out of Sodom. And he reveals things to people that are walking by faith. Noah and Abraham was an example to this point. And he blesses some people because of other people. Noah's family was saved because of Noah. Noah built an ark. Noah built an ark to the saving of his house. And the progeny of Abraham are blessed because of Abraham. He blesses some people because of the prayer of other people. Abimelech, when Abraham prayed for him, yeah. healed Abimelech. So that's some things we learn about God just, just up to this point. We're just in the, that's just through the 21st chapter. And the purpose of God is being made known all through this. A little here, a little there. At the first, he made known Satan's demise. Satan's going to be done away. And he's, he made known he's going to bless the world. Not bless him and her and them and the world. That's what he said. Bless the whole world. He ain't going to raise up a special nation. He told Abraham, I'm going to raise up a special nation. That's part of God's purpose. He's here and there. And the nature of spiritual life is being made known in these things. 
there's enmity between the world and the saints. Now, some people can't handle this, but this is the way it is. If you're a child of God, you're at loggerheads with the world, those that aren't of God. You saw it in Noah in the world. You saw it in Lot in Sodom. You saw it in Isaac and Ishmael. We're going to see it. And the righteous are vexed by ungodliness. See, this, this is the nature of spiritual life. Lot was vexed with the filthy conversation of the people in Sodom. And God will not accept substitutes <coughs> for his choices. He'll not accept Cain, even though he's firstborn. He'll not accept Eliezer as a stand-in for the seed. He will not accept Ishmael instead of Isaac. He will not accept. He has a substitute, but he will not accept man's substitute. Amen. And we've learned the righteous live by faith. See, all these things are in, this, uh, in these texts. So what is God doing? God is culturing humanity, their souls. Of course, if people aren't aware of these texts of Scripture, the culture is not going on. But he's culturing. Great, here a little, there a little, line upon line. He's teaching people about himself and culturing the soul. See, it, it has been revealed by Moses and reaffirmed by Jesus that we live by every word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Luke 4, 4. By every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4, 4 says. Now, I want to give three uh, brief encapsulations of what that means, to live by every word of God. <clears throat> First, when you hear preaching and teaching, what is said is sifted through your personal treasury of God's word. If you've got a little bitty treasure, then the sifting doesn't take very long, and it will not be very thorough. But you're living by the word of God. So as you hear, the word of God is enabling you to maintain your life by rejecting what's wrong, said what's right. Second, in the time of temptation, you live by the word of God. If you're faced with something of the eye, or, then the word of God, the Holy Spirit will take what you got in your treasure. If you don't have it in your treasury, then you, you've got nothing to work with. But if you take your treasure, it's thou shalt not cover it. You'll bring it to your, your living, see, by every word of God. And third, when dealing with people, you're able to pick up on things. See, I, could, I should press this matter further with this person here. I can, I can put the pressure on more. Well, I can see there's not much except I'm sure you know when to beg. But the Word of God, you've correlated the situation with what the Word of God says. See, you're living by the Word of God. <clears throat> now, it ought, to, it ought to be said that God will protect beginners. How long, we don't know. Because they're really not intended to stay in that state. Now, having said that, let's proceed with the text. The Lord visited Sarah, as he had said, and did unto Sarah, as he had spoken. You notice how this is, he's building this, too, that God keeps his promise. He's yeah. build, building this up for us. In other words, God works in accordance with what he said. This is, this is what people, God is at work in accordance with what you want. God is at work in accordance with what you say. He works in accordance with what he said. And, of course, if what you say is in accord with what he says, then, of course, that's another matter. <clears throat> this confirms how highly God regards his word. Yeah. Now, it says in Psalm 138.2, which we have frequently referred to, that God has magnified his word above all his name. That is, if you cannot trust what God said, you cannot trust God. That's why they said, that's why he exalted his word. The only thing you know about God, the only thing you know about God is what he said. <clears throat> that's it. You don't know one, one little morsel of knowledge about God, valid knowledge about God that he has not said in Scripture. <clears throat> the Lord visited Sarah 
exactly as he said. Now this says this part of the text, he visited Sarah and he did unto Sarah. Those two things. Those are two different things. The visited Sarah, that's the conception. And the did unto Sarah, that's the birthing. <laughs> So he had to protect Sarah during that nine-month period. She was 89 years old when she conceived. She was 90 when she gave birth. God did it. The actual birth of Isaac occurred at an appointed time. As he had spoken. You remember about one year before Isaac was born, God said to Abram, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. Yeah. Uh -huh. Then a little later, Genesis 18.10, he said, Lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. Then a little later, Genesis 18.14, he says, Sarah shall have a son. So he brought that point home. See, the closer... It comes to the time when God's going to do something, the more he, mm -hmm. yeah. more he speaks about that. Amen. Or to put it in our language, the more, closer we get to God's appointments, he'll raise up men mm -hmm. and women that will bring these things to mind. See, I'll be talking a lot about this, mm -hmm. about the thing, what God's about to do. This, this is God's manner. This, this is the way God is. So when you hear among godly men kind of a uniform type message, it's, that the Lord is coming or the, it's time to repent or you, you want to perk up when you hear that. This really is not the time for long-range planning. We're, we're not against it, understand. We're not against it. It's just that we question it. When the scriptures speak what God is capable of doing, it's stated in a manner to stress his will. Think, notice these texts. God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always have an all-sufficiency in all good things, may abound to every good work. See, so. Here's another. God, the out of him is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. See, so he's, ta he's not talking about think big things now when you pray, although there's nothing wrong with that. What he's saying, what God's devoted himself to do is bigger than you can think. So if you always come to God in view of your circumstance, this pretty much is what you do all the time. You, you approach God in view of your circumstance in your life, and it sounds to methodologists and proceduralists and people like this, this sounds really wise, but it is not really wise. Because you have no guarantee you're going to even be here tomorrow. Much less that the things you want will be given to you. They may be taken from you. So you're, the, we're, burnt, we're not saying don't make your request made known unto God, but it's tentative. If you act according to his will, that's another matter. But if you make your request known, he'll give you peace. So, so those things won't rattle you, so to speak. He is able, this is another Hebrews 7.25. He's able... To save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercessions for him. See, when he talks about God's ability, he lefts it out of human experience. You, you see that? And he's, you're, you're focusing on God. God's promise to do things that, frankly, nobody else can do. And you think of those. Or James said, there's one lawgiver who's able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? So you may say, you may speak harshly of this person or that person, but if whether or not you can carry out your judgment, that's, <laughs> that's the issue. God can. Amen. So this is why it's wrong to emphasize the miraculous and to present God primarily as a miracle worker. There are some things God does that are not directly related to his eternal purpose. Let me, let me give you some of them. Israel crossing through the Red Sea. Now that was a miracle. It was a picture of something, but the work itself 
was not integral to God's eternal purpose. Follow me in my thinking here now. Joshua commanded the sun to stand still. Yet the Israel crossed the Red Sea once. Joshua commanded the sun to stand still once. The feeding of the 5,000 once. The stilling of the tempest. These were all miraculous. But believing them would not generate faith. No matter how much you believe them, and you should believe them, that is not what generates faith. Faith comes by hearing what the message is of Christ. That's what produces faith. So if you, God does not want to be known as a miracle worker, even though they, he is a miracle worker. That's not how he wants to be known. And when Jesus was here, that's why he would say, don't tell, don't tell anybody what I did. Well, he'd go out and tell it anyway, but he did not want to be no he did not want miracle mongers to be gathering around him. That's why sometimes he'd just leave them. Go elsewhere. So the miraculous birth of Isaac is not something we should just like our mouths hang open and marvel at it. We've got to see beyond it that this had to do. <laughs> with God's eternal purpose, and that's why details are given here. You notice that these miracles of the script that Jesus did, you didn't have a lot of details. Did you notice that? You didn't have a lot of details. When you get down to this side, you got a lot of details. Yeah. Most of the people that Jesus healed and cast out demons with They know the names. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Of the 30-some miracles he did, we only that's know the right. names of less than a half a dozen of the individuals right. involved. Mm -hmm. See, now when we come to work, see working out his purpose here, now we got Abraham, we got Sarah, we got Hagar, we got Ishmael, we got Jacob, Isaac, and Jacob, and he's Lot, and he's naming names, and the, the record is extensive, you know, because he's dealing with his, his purpose. <clears throat> now, at uh, Abraham, it said that she bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time, at the set time. Of which God has spoken. Now, bearing a child <coughs> commences the bearing of the child, that's the woman bears the child. The father begets the child. So, bearing the child commences with travail and consummates in the delivery of the child. The process of conception and bearing is described in Hebrews, both processes. Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive, seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. So there's a two. These are two works. Child's conceived, and the child is protected in the womb until it's born successfully. <coughs> now, it's interesting you might... Uh, some some uh, texts of scripture say that Abraham is the one who believed the kind of God faithfully. I think I come across this. Uh, yeah, here it is. The NIV, the New Revised Standard, God's Word Bible, the New American Bible. Here's how it reads. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. So that, that those Bibles say that this refers to Abraham <laughs> instead of Sarah. So Abraham, by, this, by these Bibles, Abraham received strength, and, and he was the one that judged the God faithful that promised. Well, I don't doubt that he did, but the point in Hebrews 11 is Sarah. Not Abraham. The fact that this is written to a number of people, the Hebrews, a number of people, indicates that there is a general time period in spiritual life in which a person should reach maturity. That's the depiction of the birth process and the growth process. This, this happened at a point in time. Now, in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, 
Paul makes the point, for the reason of time, you ought to be teachers. I don't know what that, that, if that is a fixed period. I don't think it's a fixed period, but, but it, it, there is a time for everybody. Yes. When you're expected to be an adult, you're expected to be able to think without being held by the hand all the time. This is expected. You can't walk around with the brethren on your coattails all the time. Yeah. You're not to live by books and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with Isaac. When he was at an appointed time, the time came when he was to be born. He had to be born at that time. Yes, he was weaned at a special time. Yes. He became a man at a special time. Yes. Now, that's the same in spiritual life. If spiritual adulthood is not reached within a reasonable time, that would equate to Sarah conceiving and giving birth at a later time than God had appointed. That'd be just as reasonable. Be just as reasonable to say that Sarah bore the child, but it was a year and a half after God had said. We say, well, that can't be. Well, the other, the other reasoning applies too. As soon as he's born, Abraham calls him by name that God had told him, Isaac. Circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born. Now, uh, a year prior to this, God told him what to name Isaac, one year before. And in the interim, you had this lot, Sodom and Gomorrah and all these cities were destroyed and Lot took off and chased four armies. Uh, Abram took off and chased four armies. And there's some distracting type stuff that happened during that time. But Abraham didn't forget. That's right. Faith does not forget. Amen. You know that uh, within a year's period of time, a lot of people forget very, very serious things. They forget it. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't forget. Sometime before it was several years before God told him to circumcise. That's in the fifteenth chapter. He told him to circumcise. He's still in his eighties at that time. He didn't. He didn't forget this. He didn't have a reference book. He didn't have a manual to go to. He didn't have a Bible on the shelf he could read. He had to remember this. So when Isaac's born, several years after Genesis fifteen, one year after he was told what to name him, he carried out. To the finest detail, what God told him to do. That's a depiction of faith Amen. that we're seeing. Now Sarah, she was happy, to say the least. Sarah said, God hath made me laugh, so that all it here will laugh with me. She said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would should give given children suck, for I've borne him a son in old age. Now this was insightful laughter. This wasn't the kind of laughter she laughed when she was in the tent That's right. back at Genesis 17 or 18, 17 and 18. It wasn't that, that laughter. The word Isaac means happiness. So every time they said Isaac, just you can just imagine all these promises came to them and the blessings of God and all this. Just so you have a similar thing. Someone says, Jesus, see, all of a sudden, you, a lot of things. You, you remember? Um, whenever we see things by faith, we can laugh like That's this. Right. Like uh, maybe we've went through something, we look back yeah. and we can see yeah, how right. God did it. And we say, yeah, we would have never thought of that. So, you rejoice, yeah. yeah. Amen. 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 So this was insightful. Joy, rejoicing, insightful. It's a mark of faith that people had. They would trace things back to God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Friends, when Sarah couldn't have children, she said, the Lord has restrained me from bearing. Yeah, she traced it back to God. Job, when he lost everything, he said, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. So he traced it back to God. Abraham did this. He said to Abimelech, God caused me to wander. See, take that back. <laughs> Trace it back to God. And Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So he traced everything. He traced it back. Mm -hmm. So exactly what have you traced your experiences back to? See, this, I mean, this is work for you to do. 
How, how do you explain what's happened to you? Some people say, I just had a lot of bad luck. That's what happened. Just things didn't... <laughs> well, I had a lot of good luck. Things just fell out. How do you explain what's happened to you? People of faith end up connecting it Amen. with God. Now, God said this. Let's have God's own testimony on this. God said, this is found in Deuteronomy 32:39. See now, they may understand this. See now that I, even I, am He, and there is no God with me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. So, have you been wounded? Who do you think did it? Hmm? Well, I understand there's human instrumentality. But <laughs> I understand that. But see... God is the one that's overall. Amen. You've got to trace it back. If you want an answer from God, you've got to trace it back to God. But again, and this is, this is seen in these recent storms, too. That's right. Uh, that's right. Like all these tornadoes around Dallas, mm -hmm. over 650 homes destroyed, no one killed. Yep. And in another incident, a man tried to shelter three other people, covered them up with a mattress, laid on the mattress, the storm sucked him away. Saved them. He survived in the three died. Yeah. It is. Now see, back of old time, before mm -hmm. that world had been corrupted with human human understanding, yeah. people would trace it back. That's right. When the storm happened on that boat Jonah was on, they said, hey, pray to God. So yeah, something yeah. They do. When that viper fastened itself on Paul's hand, they said, they traced it back to the, those old heathens. They knew this. So something happened here. This was a murderer or something. He's being, God caught up with him. They were pagan, that's right. <laughs> now here's another statement prophets gave, but I'm talking about God now. All things trace back to God. That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west and that there is none beside me. I am the Lord. And there is none else. I form the light and create darkness, make peace. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Evil means calamity, that's, is what it means. That's what God says. What? God said this. Yeah. So when we hear of these things, we trace them back to God. Yeah. We admit we don't understand them. I mean, this doesn't mean you understand them, but God does. Here's Hosea 6 1. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. So he takes the extremities of life, wounding, binding up, wound, wounding, healing, killing, breaking life, and he traces them back to God. Now that, that can be very comforting to you. That's how you humble yourself under the mighty hand of That's God. good. That's good. Mm -hmm. See, these days, uh, professed Christian leaders, they're saying this now. This is very popular. Good things come from God, and bad things come from the devil. Well, let's see if, this, if the scripture supports this statement. Exodus 9.23 says, The Lord sent thunder and hail. Yeah. Numbers 21.6, The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. 1 Samuel 12.18, The Lord sent thunder and rain. This is devastating. Read the text. First, uh, Second Samuel twenty four fifteen, the Lord sent a pestilence. Judges nine twenty three, the Lord sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. Second Kings seventeen twenty five, the Lord sent lions among them, and yeah, the lions ate some of them. Here's Second Kings twenty four two, the Lord sent against him, sent against him bands of the Chaldees and the bands of the Syrians, bands of the Moabites, bands of the children of Ammon, and sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord which he spake by his servants the prophets. First Chronicles 21, 15. God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. Second Chronicles 32, 21. An angel who eliminated mighty leading men. And the, angels, and the Lord sent an angel who was cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and the captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. Jonah 1.4 
The Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. 2 Thessalonians 2.12 For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So, so a person should say, how can it be then that God sends only good? When you got, and I just gave you some, <laughs> the scriptures are filled. No flood, did you? That's yeah. right. Uh -huh. <laughs> Amen. Hello, Gibbon. Yeah. And also, um, as you're reading through these, it looks like it seems as though most all of these were judgment from the Lord. Yes, um, amen. That's right. He was sending these things on. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what I'm pointing out is that faith, whether even if it was beginning faith in Abraham and Sarah, they mm -hmm. they knew to do this. Yes. Amen. And the old saints, they knew to do this. Now I'm going to tell you why I think they did after these here. Mm -hmm. Holy men, after the law was given, they were able to do this because they knew Scripture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were acquainted with what God said yeah. in Scripture. Mm -hmm. And so they could make these uh, assessments. Mm -hmm. Then Sarah said, who would have said? <laughs> who would have thought that I, who would have said that I would nurse a ch Abraham's child. Yeah. Who <laughs> See, to conceive, there were three miracles right here as far as Sarah's concerned. To conceive, that was a miracle. Yeah. To give birth, that was a miracle. You had to nurse the child, that was another one. Yeah. So you had three. <laughs> three. Who would have thought this could happen? Mm -hmm. I mean, who, what doctor could we have gone to that would have told us this is possible? She saw it was impossible. Yes. Who would have thought? There is nothing observable to men that would lead them to the conclusion Sarah would have a child. Uh, I've often wondered what they thought when she was expecting. Probably the manner of women of the East is they don't wear tight clothes, nor do the men. So maybe nobody knew. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised nobody doodled it until Isaac was born. I wouldn't, wouldn't doubt it. You can't. You can't. I'm serious. When you're in the East, you can't tell. That's just the way they are. And this would be just like God. Just to develop this child right under people's nose, they don't know what's going on. And all of a sudden, whew, Sarah has a baby in there. She, just to prove it's hers, she's nursing it. <laughs> so we have in this a confirmation of the Word of God that He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask and think, according to the power that worketh or is at work in us. So he strengthened her so she had the power to do what nature would not allow her to do. See? Now he does the same with you. In Christ you receive power to do what nature doesn't enable you to do. See? Amen. Things God requires of you. It's a great truth to see. I was considering that very fact whenever uh, the scripture <clears throat> speaks about the Lord preparing that fish. Mm -hmm. He caused <laughs> To swallow Jonah, that fish normally would have destroyed the things that he'd eaten. Yeah. But this fish kept Jonah uh -huh. alive in his belly. So Amen. the Lord prepared that. But the Lord also prepared Jesus a body. <laughs> so <laughs> this isn't yeah. this isn't something that's unheard of in the scripture. The Amen. Lord prepared this body for Sarah to do the work he being called her. Yes. Amen. 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 Yeah, he... Some people have been kept safe in the midst of a storm. Yes. <laughs> Like Isaac was kept safe in the womb of a frail, yes. outwardly frail woman. I was thinking while you're speaking there that all of us, everyone who's ever been delivered from sin can say, who would have thought? Who would have thought, yeah. who would have thought that this <laughs> sinful person Amen. could have come to the knowledge of the truth? Well, let me ask you right now. Mm -hmm. You go back 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. Would you have dreamed you know and see what you do now? No. See that that's your that's your evidence. You you're a walking testimonial. You know it isn't according to your education or your intellectual aptitude or you you know it's not from that at all. So God is see, this is a depiction. God's culturing us, see? Teach us how he works. Now the child grew, was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast. So, like, when did they wean the child? 
And so there's a variety of opinions, but everybody concedes that the oldest it would have been was three. Three years old. He was Wayne. And wean means not nursed anymore. To eat solid, solid food. That ought to, <laughs> ought to, you ought to be able to draw some parallels there. You get to the point you can eat some solid yeah. food. Yeah. In Christ, you can same thing. You, when you're weaned in Christ, you can eat the solid meat. Yeah. You know, get the get a little higher level of nourishment. Now here's another thing that's interesting in Scripture. He, he just hits high points. So from Isaac's birth to three, we, we, we don't know anything about what happened. And then from three till he, uh, from three till he was, Abram's going to offer him on the altar. We don't, know, we don't know anything about that. And I gave you some of what people said about that, but they calculate that Isaac was somewhere between 18 and 33, so he, he wasn't like a little kid. And yet, you know, from three to that period, you, you don't know anything. From Abraham to one to 75, you don't know anything. Jesus, from two to 12, you know nothing. From 12 to 30, you know nothing, see? That's God, what God does. And well ought you to thank God for it. There's parts of my life I thank God they can be forgotten. Amen. God just deals with these high points. <laughs> Something to see, isn't it? So Abraham made this great feast, abundant feast. Some versions say he gave a party. I don't like that because that word party doesn't... He has more of an accent on fun than on feast. Feast on cupcakes and Twinkies, you know. That's what some say. He gave a party. In the English Revised Version said he gave a big party. This was a feast. It wasn't for the kids. Yeah, that's right. It was for the older to see. There's a walk in living. This is a living testimony of the work of God. Yeah. And at this feast, Sarah sees the son of just lest we forget, Hagar the Egyptian, lest, lest we forget, <laughs> lest we forget, Hagar the Egyptian mocking. Now again, some versions, I don't know what they were thinking about, but they say they, she saw him playing with Isaac. That's to the New King James Version, that's what, uh, I believe it's the NIV says that. Playing with that's the new revised standard. And in others say teasing, in other words. But this was this was not just childish giggling and this kind of thing, not to prompt this kind of remark. Now uh, Ishmael was thir was uh, thirteen years old when he was circumcised. That's Genesis seventeen twenty-five. So you add on that a minimum of three years, you could add four. And so he's like, a, he's a, he's a mid-teens. He's 15, 16 years old. It's, he's not a little kid. He's a young man. And he's mocking a little child. That's three. And so Sarah takes note of this. And she says to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this, this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. So she was not tolerant of this situation at all. She didn't say, well, kids will be kids. You know how it is. Right. Yeah. People may pass stuff off like that today, but these people didn't do that. No, it wasn't quite that, that simple, simple. She knows the promise of God that the heirship is going to go to Isaac. Yeah. So there's no sense in us having Hagar and his son stay in the house causing this agitation. Amen. So Abraham, get rid of them. Throw them out. Cast them out. It sounds harsh, doesn't it? <laughs> Good thing this wasn't done in America in 
2012, yeah, that's right. then it had gone to court. Now, it's true, according to the flesh, it seemed like a heartless thing. But see, these people are thinking about God's purpose. They're not thinking just about yeah. family experience. That's right. Amen. You know that because she's an heir. Uh -huh. So she's not thinking about just family life or the situation at home. She's thinking about the promise of heirship. That's what she's thinking about. There's, she knows Ishmael doesn't fit in there. Uh -huh. And we've got to concentrate now on raising the heir. We can't be concentrating on raising someone's not going to participate at all. That's how she's thinking now. Whatever you may think about the rightness and wrongness of it, God's going to back her up. Yeah. And when she said this, this was grievous to Abraham. Oh, boy. Because this was his son. Uh -huh. He loved Ishmael. Remember he said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before the... He didn't mean to live as the heir. Don't, don't abandon Ishmael. He had, a, he had a care for Ishmael. Was his son. Was... Well, his, he was grieved by it. It was difficult for him. It appeared very hard. The fact that he loved Ishmael, he did. Yeah. Yeah. But, but God uh, had assured Abram that he was going to take care of Ishmael. He told him before. Here's his word, Genesis 17, 20. This would have been spoken several years before this. As for Ishmael, I've heard thee, when he said, oh, that Ishmael might live, I've heard thee. And I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget and I'll make him a great nation. However, my covenant will I establish with Isaac. So Abraham knew this too. So now he's got to make this difficult decision. <laughs> All decisions aren't easy to make. Some decisions are hard to make. But the Lord asked us to make them anyway. Amen. Here's one Jesus. He, here's a decision Jesus said we have to make. If any man come to me and hate not his father, mother, and wife, brother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, in his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Yeah. Hate That is to say what he's saying is when there's a conflict between these that I've mentioned and me, yeah. you've got to choose me. Amen. Or I will not teach you. Uh -huh. That's your right. Well, see, that's not easy to do. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Some of us have had to do this. It wasn't easy to do. Amen. We should never present it as though it is. Yeah, and you just right. do it, you know, without any thought. No, no, it's not that. It's not intended to be an easy thing to do. It's a, because the sacrifice yeah, right. is what it is. This is a very, oh, yeah. very yeah. grievous thing to, mm -hmm. to, to encounter when that has to be done. And two, remember, we're dealing with an ordained type uh -huh. yeah. here that's going to be developed. Paul developed it in Galatians. So it, the, the reason that this type or antitype is what we call the, the antitype. The type is what occurred back here. The antitype is what it answered to. This antitype means that this type's got to be precise. It can't, right. it can't be general uh -huh. because it's going to depict a spiritual condition. Yeah. And you're going to be able to understand a spiritual circumstance through, by means of this account we're reading right here now. So here's what Paul said about it. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. That would have meant nothing if, this, if Abraham didn't carry this out. See, so God's purpose is what drives things. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. You can see that, I'm sure, but it, it's just refreshing for me <laughs> to think about it. Confirms that Isaac was not just playing with, uh -huh. Ishmael yeah. was not just playing with Isaac. Right. He was persecuting Isaac. Amen. See, right. Paul, Paul clears the thing up, and uh -huh. people have trouble with it. Paul clears it up. Uh -huh. It arose because some people are born of God and some are not. And the two can't get along 
together. Jesus said sometimes that it was fulfilled in this text. A man's foes shall be they of his own house. Or it was lived out right back there in Abraham. Reach back now yes. and, right. and and bring that truth that God right. intended for that. That's right. To, he he did all that so this truth would be brought out That's later right. on. Paul picked that up. It's mm -hmm. too lofty of a truth to be brought out by normal domestic situation, you see. That's right. We all partake of that now. That's we right. We've yeah. all entered into That's that. That's right. Every believer. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this helps to clarify our own personal experiences. We will live by faith. Why some animosities arise that are not pleasant or not displeasing, and we can't account for them. And he accounts for them here. Yes, he accounts for them here. Yes. He that's of the flesh uh -huh. persecutes he that's of the spirit. Yes. But now Abraham and Sarah. Sarah was able to see that pretty clearly. That's right. Abraham couldn't see it. That's but right. she saw that was no good going to come from this kind of thing. That's know? right. She yep. saw that right off the bat. That's right. And uh, there's been other couples. Yeah. In scripture like this, where oh, the, uh, one one partner can say, "This is not a good thing." That's huh? right. Mm -hmm. See, this is teaching us that God works through male or and female. Uh -huh. yeah, that's right. Some people cast in stone; they just they just like sew the woman's mouth shut. Uh -huh. yeah, uh -huh. But here now, God God comes into the picture now. Uh -huh. While this is grievous, yeah. you can you kind of see Abram thinking about this. Yeah. God said to Abram, "Let it not be grievous in thy sight." Now, who but God can say that? Stop crying. Yeah, just stop that. Maybe you said it to your children. I just stop that crying now. Well, <laughs> it's not always that easy. Let it not be grievous on thy sight because of the lad and because of the bondwoman. In all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. He said that before. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. So this isn't going to be the end of Ishmael. Yeah. Ishmael doesn't have to be raised in your house. Uh -huh. So he's going to command to be, command to be do, done, do something that is to be understood in the context of faith. See, cast him out. Not, don't cast him out because he can't get along with Isaac. That's not what he said. Cast him out because he can't be an heir. Yeah. To cast him out. Do you think of that when you read things like, put off the old man. Yeah, yeah, no, now you make sense. Get rid of that. Because yeah, it can't be an heir. Yeah. Crucify the flesh. Why? Because it can't be an heir. Yes. That's why. So when it comes to matters pertaining to the Lord, husband doral authority doesn't apply. Now, some people don't agree with this, but that makes a difference. When it comes to being before the Lord, there isn't male or female. Every person stands on their own before the Lord. They don't. The only representative you have is Christ. When you're a wife, you're only represented before God is Christ. There's one mediator, and it's not your husband. It doesn't mean you don't respect them and you don't honor them and you don't obey them. It doesn't mean that. It just means when it comes to the things of God, uh -huh. there's no such thing as husband yeah. uh -huh. yeah. or wife uh -huh. or master uh -huh. or servant or Jew or Greek. Right. <laughs> Those distinctions, they don't apply. So God just, he speaks to clarify this. You know this. When it comes to the will of God and obeying God and living unto God, every person, is, is their only contact is Christ. It's so far as effectively being with God. When the ways of the Lord have been made known, no domestic arrangement is to supersede them. See, under this time, Sarah called Abram Lord, and I mean, she did afterward too, but in this matter here, this had pertained to God's purpose. So it's lifted out of the domain of domestics. Hearken to her voice. See, God has no sympathy for flesh. <laughs> Even if it's Abraham's flesh. Don't allow this painful thing to distract you, Abraham. We're setting up a situation here. It's being set up so that my children, centuries up there, are going to learn from this a very valuable lesson. 
So this has got to be carried out because it fits in, see, to my eternal purpose. And then Isaac, he reaffirms again. See, God reaffirms foundational type things. See, in Isaac shall I seed because Isaac's, he's your progenitor. The, the next generation that I'm going to bless is going to come through Isaac. It's not going to come through Ishmael. So Abraham uh, did what God told him to do. Now here's the apostolic doctrine I want to comment on. You, can't, uh, you cannot account for the preference of Isaac over Ishmael apart from the choice of God. Right? It wasn't their character. I mean, Isaac was three. I mean, <laughs> Ishmael's in his teens. So the reason for this wasn't, was, wasn't because of Ishmael or Isaac. It was because of God's purpose. And I want to give the, some apostolic doctrine on this. The doctrine is developed in the, in the epistle to the uh, Church of Galatians. They were called into the grace of God and they left it. They left God in order that they might embrace another gospel. Now my point that I'm developing here is God will not depart from his purpose to suit the fancies of men. Amen. And when you when you left the gospel, you left God. Amen. Hmm? Yeah. Well, I put it out, if, if Abraham had not cast out Ishmael, he had abandoned God. By that act, he would have left God. And God would have left him. That's how serious it is. See, the gospel has to do with the experience of salvation. It announces a salvation, but it's the experience of salvation that is the issue at stake. And Ephesians one thirteen tells us, In whom ye also trusted after ye heard the truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also after ye believed ye are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The salvation of a person depends on their reliance on what God has promised. Amen. Just as Abraham's acceptance depended upon his reliance on what God promised. Amen. See? Amen. A lot of people don't know what God has promised, so they should make it their business to know what God has promised. Now, if the, let's say if the gospel is not regularly declared in a church setting. Let's say that this is the circumstance. And the people are being set up for a fall. Because mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. believe me, something else will be made an emphasis. Every right. church has some emphasis. Right. They've got something they're underlining, some main thing. Yeah. In Abraham's house, if it wasn't Isaac, it was wrong. Yeah, that's right. yeah. You got to cast out whatever doesn't complement yeah. this promise. Yeah. It has to be cast out. And Paul says, "Our brethren, we are children of promise. We're we're the children God promised. Well, what kind of children did God promise? Huh? They shall all know me. Yes. Uh -huh. I'll write my law in their hearts and put it in their minds. See." He told us what God, he, we've got promises Amen. about what we are in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Now, whatever contradicts that promise, whatever is a part of our life that contradicts that promise, has to be cast out. Yes. You've got to make the transition now from Israel yeah. and Isaac to, to you and Christ. Whatever does it is not compatible. Whatever tends to dull your perception of eternal life and what God has promised, whatever tends to dull that, you got to get it out. Amen. And no, since no man knows the things of a man, say the spirit that's in him, this is a personal 
type responsibility. It's not up to anyone to do this for somebody else because we can't. But this does have to be done. Now there's a there's a process in salvation, just like there was a process in Isaac. First, there was a promise: Isaac shall thy seed be called. Abraham was called to leave where he was at. He was told to be the father of many nations. Then he was told a year, year in advance, about this time next year, Sarah shall have a child. Then Isaac was born. So he was a process. Now we're chosen unto salvation. It's a promise. We're sanctified by the Spirit, as Second Peter one two. We're called through the gospel. To the obtaining of glory by Jesus Christ, and we're born again in Christ. It's a, it's a process, just like, just like Isaac, from promise to fulfillment. And the same is true of our ultimate fulfillment, to ever be with the Lord. It's the activity of God that is at the root or causal level of our salvation. Amen. Not what we did, that's not at the root. It's part of it, but it's not at the root. Mm -hmm. It's not the root of the tree, it's a branch, see? And to think of it this way is edifying. For instance, Paul said to the Thessalonians, We're bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation, see? Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, see? It's a process. So it's the kind of process you look back to. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't see this when you're coming in. But yeah. after you're in, good preaching and teaching will enable you to look back and uh -huh. you, can, you can see. Mm -hmm. When all of a sudden you obtained an interest in the things of God, you, you were sensitive with the things of God, your conscience was pricked. See, that was yeah. the work. God was working there. Yes? Looking back is your assurance of the foundation. Oh, that yes. Your faith is built on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is what brings the assurance. Amen. You, you see what God has done, in other words. Yeah. yeah. So, Abraham, he, uh, he rose up early in the morning and got right at this. Rose up early in the morning, took bread and a bottle of water and gave it to Hagar, put it on his shoulder and the child, and sent her away. Was it easy? <laughs> Oh, no, it wasn't easy. Neither was offering up Isaac. That wasn't easy either. And I don't imagine pulling up roots when you're 75 years old was easy either. That's right. Amen. Uh -huh. So God doesn't call us to ease. Because it, it's hard. I don't know exactly how to say this, but it's difficult for God to show himself in easy circumstances. It seems like man's made that way. That If it's easy, it's like his brain shuts off, <laughs> so to speak. There's not a lot of thought done, but in the, in a, when you're in the fire yeah. and when you're being tested or when you're being pushed forward, uh -huh. y your thinking is more precise. This yeah. is just the way it is in Christ. And I, you've probably seen this yourself. Yeah, because when it's, when it's easy, then you tend to think the flesh is doing it. That's it. Mm -hmm. yep. Brother Given, this, now this dedication they had to the to the inheritance which Isaac yeah. represented right. that being trusted Isaac personified or, or he represented that in, that promise of God so now That's they right. focus in on him and I, I was thinking as you was talking about that this is a, a, a great thing to see because now we have Abraham uh, Isaac and Jacob now these three men now they dedicated their all their being yeah. to culturing this promise and in his inheritance yeah. for mm -hmm. the people of God that would of course Come on later. You know that yeah. phrase, um, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Mm -hmm. All three of those births were miraculous. Yeah, right. uh -huh. Interesting, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you can see that all three of those births, all three of the women were barren. Yeah. All three of those births, so the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, see, and that was proved in their, yeah. in their very births. I will see that Abraham immediately responds, just like he always has. I'll just briefly review this. When he was initially called, when, here's how it says in Hebrews 11, when he was called to go out, he went out. Yeah, that's right. See? 
when he left Haran. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Genesis 12, 4. When God promised him the land of Canaan, he built an altar to the Lord and who had appeared unto him. I'm showing you here that Abraham responded immediately to what God did. When God told him of the number of seed he was going to have, he believed in the Lord. When he gave him that remarkable promise. When God made the covenant of circumcision, he immediately circumcised Ishmael, all the household himself. See, immediately respond. Let's hear God comment about Abraham. Let's hear God's comment about Abraham. I know him. He will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of judgment to do justice and judgment. Yes. Let's, uh, Abraham's obedience when he was told to offer his son. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went under the place. Yeah. Which God see, immediately obeyed. Let's, let's, Steve, let's call Stephen to the witness stand. What does Stephen say? He said, men and brethren and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charon. And said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come unto the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land. Yes, amen. See? Let's hear Paul. Paul called a witness then. What do you think, Paul, about Abraham's obedience? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Here's another statement. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which is spoken, so shall I seed be. Here's a reference to Abraham in the book of Hebrews. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out of the place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out. Here's another statement. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. See, so all through Scripture, remember, Abraham is faith personified. Faith always obeys. Amen and does so instantly. It's unbelief that doesn't obey. Great truth to see. So God is shaping our thoughts here. He's shaping our thoughts about Him. He's shaping our thoughts about faith. Shaping our thoughts about response to God. So He sent Hagar out. She went into the wilderness and wandered. Wander wasn't, uh, doesn't mean aimless wandering means she didn't have a certain dwelling place. She's trying to find a place of convenience. Just imagine now that we had no roads, no maps, nothing like that, and someone told you to go from Joplin to St. Louis, and you're unfamiliar with the territory. Now you know what a wandering means. <laughs> That they were without all those conveniences we've learned to live with. That's what it means she wandered. And once she wandered the water, she used up all the water. Water was spent. Now we're going to learn here that God doesn't work till you don't with a till help can't come from any place else. This is the way God is now. now sometimes you'll feel utterly helpless and you can't find resources and you're, you wonder what, it, well, that just means God's about to do something because this, this is how God works. He waits until you know when the help comes, you'll know it didn't come from any, any place else. Water was spent and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. Doesn't mean she threw him down there. <laughs> she placed him down there because he probably, probably was unconscious, I would imagine. She saw all the water, all the resources were expended. All hope is gone. Nothing I can do about the situation. She did lay him under shade there, a little bit of shade. Comfortable as possible. Sometimes people are passing away and they thought the best thing you can do is make it as comfortable as you can for them. So that's what she did. Then she went and sat over against him or opposite him a good way off. Yeah, just, it's too hard for her to watch. Mm -hmm. Whatever you may think about Hagar, the Egyptian, 
She was a mother. Yeah, that's right. This was a hard experience. She, didn't, she couldn't stand to see it, so she went, got away. So she was close enough if anything changed, but she's a long way off. See, there are, there are situations you can't get out of. There are things, there are dilemmas you can't extricate yourself from. No matter how much money you got, how much influence you got, how much wisdom you got, there are situations like that. Just like this. Paul listed a number of them that he went through. Of the Jews, five times received I, forty stripes saved one, thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I was shipwrecked, needless. There were things he could not do anything about. Your life was the same. You've, th th things have happened to you, you could not do anything about it. Amen. See, that's a prime time for God to act. That, that's the kind of circumstance God uh, works in. See, Paul, he, there were times when he addressed the authorities and appealed to Caesar and talked to the soldier, to the captain, about not beating up on Roman citizens. And then there were times he, there wasn't anything he could do. That's where, he, that's where Hagar is. Nothing she could do. So she just sat down, kind of waited for things to play out. She cried out. I don't know if she was praying or not. Let me not see the death of the child. Child dying of thirst. I mean, it would be a hard thing to see. She speaks in her distress. Don't let me see the boy die. Remember, he's a 15, 16 year old boy. It wasn't a little, little child. She's resigned to the fact that Ishmael's going to die. Hagar was, uh, while she may have been very aware of God, did not have the faith of Abraham. She'd been in Abraham's house, but she didn't have the faith of Abraham. She couldn't think like Abraham thought during this circumstance. So she lifted up her voice and wept. Now, until you've been in the East, you don't know anything about this, because in America, people subdue their expressions of grief, but this isn't the way the rest of the world is. They have... When they cry, they you'll see them sometime on the news. They, they shout and so when it says she lifted up her voice, that's exactly what it means. And it was a in a lot of grief. And here's an interesting thing that the uh, New American Bible represents Ishmael as being the one that cried. Said he began to cry. <laughs> So that, it, some of the Bibles kind of confuse things for people. But I do not see that that's, that's if this is a petition, Hagar is the one offering the petition because the answer is given to her. So I want to make a point here that Hagar did not have the faith of Abraham. See, God had spoken to Hagar previously about Ishmael. That's right. yeah. She should have been able to reason if she had faith, that Ishmael wasn't going to die. When God asked Abraham to offer Isaac, he reasoned that God was going to raise him from the dead. He, he knew this isn't going to end this way. But see, Hagar was a type of the law now. Hagar couldn't think like this. And those who operate under a system of law, they can't think like this. When things look impossible, they don't think, I will flee to God. They don't think this isn't the way they think. Flesh doesn't think this way. It just lifts up his voice in laments. See, he said, let me tell you, remind you what he told her. He will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. That's after he'd grown up. See, she had that promise. As for Ishmael, I've heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him. I will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget. I will make of him a great nation. I'm sure Abraham passed that on to Hagar. So there was enough information had been given from, given from heaven that Hagar should not have reasoned he's going to die. But she did. Because she's a bondwoman. She depicted a law system that can't can't think that yeah. way. This is thinking of faith. This is faith thinking. Now we're told that Hagar is a type of the law. Galatians 4.24 Which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants 
the one from Mount Sinai which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is the bondage with the children. So Hagar was a type, a tailored type, a divinely developed type of a law system for salvation. This kind of system does not produce reliance upon God. And for some of us that were once in bondage to that, we know this very, very well. It does not produce reliance upon God. Those who live by faith find hope surfacing in the time of trial. See? Yes. It's the opposite. In this type of way will come to the end of their strength and not have any hope. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Without hope. That's yeah. Amen. Now God hears the voice of the lad. Yeah, there's God's pity. <laughs> you wonder if God has pity? Yeah, he heard the voice of that boy. Which is a, in the death throes. And the angel of the Lord called to Hagar. Heard the voice of the lad. The angel called to Hagar and he said, what aileth thee? <laughs> yeah. what, what, what aileth thee? Ye angels, they know they're not touched by human circumstance. Yeah. Uh -huh. Other versions read, what's the matter with you? It's a new American standard. What's the matter with you, Hagar? You know, but he said, what's, what troubles you? <laughs> what's, what's wrong? The whole of Christian Bible says, what art thou doing, the new version says. Why are you weeping? Basic Bible English. Why are you so worried? Yeah, this is an angel talking. The angel's view of views of things aren't like human yeah. <laughs> views of things. But I don't know if it's an angel that sometimes you hear or not, or whether it's the Spirit speaking to you, but sometimes you'll be agitated about something, and you can hear like a voice will say, what are you, what are you, what are you troubled about? What? Is this really that big of an issue? <laughs> yeah, if you're sensitive, I'm telling you, this will come to you. Hey. Hope thou in God, he shall yet be the health of your countenance. Yes, amen. Hopeless is a word that belongs to this world, not the world to come. Yeah. So heaven's view is different. It reminds me of the uh, statement of Jesus when he came to Jairus' house. Remember when his daughter, 12-year-old daughter, died and they were weeping and carrying on? He said, uh, why make ye this ado? Commotion. What's all this commotion about? And why are you weeping? <laughs> it must have sounded like a foolish question to those people, you remember? Then he says, fear not. Don't. Fear not. That phrase is mentioned 63 times in Scripture. Fear not from heaven. Fear not. Say, well, how can a person like stop fearing? <laughs> you know, huh? it's because what it says a fear not is like a command. Let there be light. Yeah. See? Amen. See, it's it doesn't. He's not saying do your best not to fear. When that word fear not, that's like a that's like a divine command. Like let there be light, mm -hmm. or peace be still. Yeah. See, uh -huh. it's that kind of thing. So, fear not means that he he is quieting the. Yeah. Before she can move and intelligently, that she has to get her heart quiet. Fear not. You uh, arise. Let's get up now. Lift up the lad and hold him, hold him in thy hand, for I will make him a great nation. I get hold him in the hand means that hold him by by the hand. Remember, this is a, a teenage boy. Some versions say, "This is the good news Bible. Pick him up and comfort him." Basic Bible says, "Take the arm in your, take the child in your arms." You know, you can imagine <laughs> picking up a sixteen-year-old. That's not what he's saying. What he's telling you is that the lad raised up. He's already getting strength. Yeah. He was ready to die, but I've already given him some strength to stand up. You just, but you'll have to support him. You'll, you'll have to support him. But he can walk. See? 
Well, if you can see it, there's people like this. They just had to be given a hand, you know. God gives them strength. They can walk. The Lord, he can give them a hand and support them. God still enables people who's lost their strength to regain it. Amen. Now then God uh, opens Hagar's eyes. She saw a well of water. I don't know if it was there all along, but grief draws a veil over your eyes. Now, if you live long enough, you'll see this. Sorrow has a kind of a blinding Grief and sorrow have a kind of a blinding effect. But he opened up her eyes, thinking there was, whoa, it's a well of water there. Now you'll notice something here, how God uh, provided for this. She filled the bottle. The bottle? The bottle. Why anybody else would have thrown it away? There was no need for the bottle, uh -huh. right? The bottle was dry. But God kept her from throwing it away. He knew he was going to fill it. She didn't know. So she took the bottle. <laughs> that meant a lot to me, the bottle. So you ought to learn to do this as you live. Don't throw away any previous bodies of thought that you've had. I keep them. Don't discard them. The old timers used to say, don't throw the baby out with the bath water. You know, they'd say, don't, don't, don't throw everything away. You opened her eyes. Now, and she saw this well. That she needed to survive. That's right. Now there's a wonderful parallel, of course, in the spirit. Paul, he said, David said, "Open my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things in thy law." That is that I know that I know there's a well of water here. Mm -hmm. I can sense it, Lord. There's a well here, but open up my eyes so I can yeah. see it. Amen. See. He'll do that. He did it for Hagar. Paul was appointed, you know, to open men's eyes, show them the well, show them the well. Paul prayed that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. And at any rate, uh, what's involved in opening somebody's eyes? Well, Satan has to be restrained. That's, that's one thing. Satan has to be restrained. And despair has to be superseded with a flicker of hope. Yeah. See? And she probably now scanned the area with a little bit of hope. They, they changed that. So now you can look more closely at the area, not being bowed down with grief. And she, of course, has moved to keep her container. See, all that, God was in all that. See, there comes a time in a person's life when they have a dominating interest in the things of God. What's happened? Oh, they got the bottle. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and a time when Satan's rebuked and a person just makes it determined, I'm not going to listen anymore. See, yeah. see God's, God's in there. And when a servant of God is sent to announce some glad tidings, hey, look, we got something from God that Taylor made for this. And other things lose their priority. Well, as stated in words of, of, the, of Scripture, Proverbs 16.1, the preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Go oh, the Lord. Amen. See? Yeah. And she gave the lad to drink. So men passing through grievous circumstances. I remember a word... Uh, I think it was in Job, there's lifting up to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Think of the Lord's when you see these things, Pastor, lift up your head, for your redemption head. draweth up. That's yes, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Job 22, 29, when men are cast down, then thou shalt say there is lifting there up. There is lifting mm -hmm. up. And he shall mm -hmm. say. This is, this is a marvelous thing because when you're in that downward spiral, it's like you can't. Yeah. stop it. You That's can't right. seem to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And then there really isn't a fleshly explanation for why you've come up out of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, but this is it. God said something. Amen. Spoke. Amen. Yeah. Now what a word this is. God is with the lad. We're talking about Ishmael now. God is with the lad. He tells you earlier that it was for Abraham's sake because he's your son. Yeah. Then he's going to be used to populate some people and nations that are going to turn to the Lord when the nations, when 
But the knowledge of the Lord fills the earth like the waters cover the sea. Some of the some of Ishmael's offspring are going to be involved in that. God is with the lad, and he dwelled in a wilderness. That's what God said. He'd be like a wild man, you remember? Wandering about. So he dwelt in a wilderness. And it was the wilderness of Paran. We'll hear about the wilderness of Paran later. The wilderness of Paran is where Israel was when they sent out the spies and they gave the bad report. Remember, that's where, that's where they were. And it's that wilderness, I give you the text, it's that wilderness that they wandered in and the unbelievers died. Yeah. You'll wander in this wilderness, the script says. So the wilderness of Paran, see? <laughs> Now you're, you're, something you want to notice here that all of a sudden our attention has been focused on a certain ge geographical part of the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. The wilderness of Paran is just north of the Sinaitic Peninsula on Mount Sinai is right in that. So everything's shifting attention there. And then it says that he, Hagar took him a wife from Egypt. Apparently she never she never really got over Egypt. She didn't take him from uh, Abraham's brother Nahor. He's mentioned in Scripture. God was his God. She didn't seek a daughter from them. Then there was Lot's daughters. He had a couple of daughters. They didn't seek him there. Went back to Egypt. And that's where she uh, sought him. So slowly, as I mentioned, our attention is being drawn to the part of the world which everything is going to be wrought. Yeah. Israel is going to be located there. Prophets are going to prophesy there. Law is going to be given there. Prophets are going to prophesy there. John the Baptist is going to be preached there. Jesus is going to be born there. The apostles are going to minister there. See, this is going to be the place where all the divine workings are, are going to be done. So the stage is being set for the rest of Revelation. <laughs> I wanted to close with these words here. An effective salvation required that several things had to be done before Jesus came. And when I want to name some of them here, I'll just probably name a few of these. A salvation must be developed that allows God to fulfill it in a righteous manner. So this kind of preparation has to be done. God must make himself known as a God that is intolerant of sin. That, that message you got to get across. A means must be developed to introduce a man into the world that has a more precise image of God than Adam had. This is not just going to just happen. It's got, it's got to be prepared. The required man can't be traced back to Adam. There can be no question about it. Special generations must be developed through whom God can work, which will lead to the birth of Christ. It's about the consciousness of God, faith in Him, obedience to Him. A spiritual culture must be developed in which the Messiah can be born and grow up in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. It has to be a kind of a climate where Jesus can develop as a young man. An existing land must be occupied by a chosen people in which the knowledge of God can be cultured. In this case, the land is like a seminary that taught of God. The nature and potency of faith, that had to be revealed over a period of time because this has to do with realities that men know nothing about, see? And Satan uh, must finally and completely be overcome by a man, so you've got to set the stage for this to happen. And the, pot the nature and potency of faith, that's got to be demonstrated so people can see this. Because he's going to call out when Jesus comes, whosoever believes, he's going to call it out. Well, you've got to have a lay of groundwork for what that, right. what that means. The righteous law must be established to define sin. Man must be able to ultimately have eternal life without any vestige of sin. You've got to prepare for that. Because of the divining effects of sin, provision must be made for a new heavens and a new earth. 
The power of God must be sufficiently demonstrated so that men can learn to fear Him. Got to be enough about God to reveal that men can yeah. fear. The fact that humanity cannot change its own nature must clearly be confirmed. The fact that God can work outside of the confinement of nature must be verified. Because God works all things after the counsel of His will, the entirety of salvation must be driven by a divine purpose, eternal purpose, not by human need. Amen. The right and reality of God's choice has been got to be made clear because He's going to save Him by a chosen man. And a righteous, a righteous means must be implemented so that the guilt of sin can be removed. I won't read any more of these, but you can see these are all things that were developed in, in the beginning history and on it, that these things were developed so when John the Baptist came as a forerunner, everything was ready. See, all, all they needed perceptions had been developed and now people had paid attention to God. They'd be able to identify Jesus. They'd be able to believe on him. They knew what he came to do, see? So that's what we're, that's what we're seeing here in... Uh, the book of Genesis, and it's quite, it's quite edifying to see it. Amen. Any of you have a word you'd like to add tonight? Well, this thing uh, you mentioned about um, the, uh, the preference and how of the family or, or the or that it's not easy. God doesn't call you into easy things. I was thinking while you were speaking about that, um, you know, it, it, it can be simplified. In Christ, Christ simplifies these things to some degree. He said, he asked the question, who is my mother and father? Yeah. So when you come into Christ and, 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 and you give your life to him, he, he enables you. These are not easy things to do, but, but they can be simplified in that if you choose Christ first, yeah. ahead of time, then when these other matters come, when there is a when there is yeah. a hard time that comes up, so you've already made your mind up. If you can say yeah, with you can say with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we we're not careful to answer That's right. you. Amen. These things, even though they're hard, even though they may cause some grief, you've already made your mind up. I'm going with Christ. Yeah. He, he he's the number one, and then all these other things there, there um you can do them. In other words, by mm. faith you can do them, and um so God hasn't called us to do something that that we can't do. Amen. Anyone else, Brother Ricky? Talked about tracing everything back to God. I thought about, you know, when Jesus stood before Pilate. Yeah. <laughs> Pilate mm -hmm. said, Do you know who I you am? You know who I am. And Jesus Amen. said, You would have no power over me had not been given you from heaven. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I don't know how a person could could in a sense be subject to a man so cruel as that, except he knows that that man is being that's controlled right. by God. That's exactly and that's right. the way we look at all of our circumstances. Yeah, Remember when right. David, he uh, he was faced with multiple choices when uh, he had numbered the people yeah, yeah. and he <laughs> fell into the hands of God because mm -hmm. he knew mm -hmm. the absolute cruelty of men. Yeah. And that's how we approach sufferings. We don't focus on the one who is persecuting us. Yeah. Yeah. We rely on the God who is yeah, over right. the one who is... That's right. You say like, that's right. like David did, you know, when... when uh, and that, that, who was the man that threw stones at him, Chimney, you know, and jeered yeah, at him? Yeah. He said the Lord provoked him to do this. God yes, right. told him to do this. So that encourage that way your faith can your faith can encourage you to look at the situation yeah. as it really is. Mm -hmm. God is in control of this and he's good. Yeah. it has a purpose to it. Amen. 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 Mm. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Mm. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this record and for the insight it gives into your working. We thank you that it is you with whom we have to do and that you're a God of grace and power. And we thank thee that this has been revealed to us through Christ Jesus. We seek for grace to live in a becoming manner so that we will be able to instantly respond to your word. In Jesus' name. Amen.